So in the talk about advanced class design, Jim, right, Jim, right, asked who here has created a parser? And a surprisingly significant amount of the audience raised their hands. Yes, they had created a parser. Awesome, thank you very much. I'll see if I need it. Um, and it was surprising because I assumed that everyone interpreted that question as, has anyone used a formal grammar-based parsing framework to create a parser? Um, so if I assume that people interpret it that way, it's a surprising number of people that have. Um, but it was also surprising that such a low number of people raised their hands because almost all of us, at some point or another, must have written a parser. All of us, at some point or another, in our everyday tasks as programmers, have to deal with text. We're usually using regular expressions and some combination of them in kind of an ad hoc programming that combines them with procedures. And we're writing custom code that walks line by line through text files and splits things apart and then hands them to other procedures and mutates strings and arrays. And it's always different every single time. It's usually ugly. It's kind of the bottom feeder activity of the programming world. Um, and the truth is, is that it doesn't usually have to be that way. So there's another group of people, smaller, and those are the programming language designers that also are kind of the mother of all text mungers. Their job is to take input from a text file and produce a program out the other side, but they don't go through the program line by line and split it apart and do all these manual things in most cases. They use a more powerful tool for the job, and that is the tool of context-free grammars. So they use regexes as well, for the most part. Um, and the everyday programmer uses regexes. So why is it that the e everyday programmer does not dine at the table with the language designers when it comes to using the more powerful theoretical tools that they employ for text analysis, context-free grammars? And I posit that the main reason that is the case is that the conceptual and technical overhead of using the traditional context-free grammar generator tools is too high to make it worthwhile for anything but the most complex textual analysis problems. Rather than hooking up let's and yak or antler or whatever, we'd rather just write some regexes and some loops and get on with our day. But writing regexes and loops, for the most part, leads to software that is less maintainable than it needs to be. If we could somehow harness the power of context-free grammars in our everyday programming practice, I think it would make all of our lives a lot easier and a new crop of parsing technologies has emerged and a lot of tools are coming out in the past few years that I really think have a revolutionary uh, level of ease of use that's gonna lower the barrier to entry and soon we're all gonna be using context-free grammars all over the place in our programs and our day-to-day -day programming experience. And it's gonna spell the end of these ridiculous text munging programs that iterate through lines. Um, and the tool that I wrote that I'm gonna be introducing today is one, one of these tools, and it's designed for the Ruby programming language. Um, so, what is a context-free grammar? I've referred to it, hey, I don't have video, do I? It's really unfortunate. Hey, can I get video to work? I plugged the laptop in. Can you open your laptop? It's open. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyway, I'll talk about it without the slide. Uh, yeah. Sorry about this, guys. Lame, I realize. Got it. Um, so what's up with it, huh? System preferences? Oh my god, Quicksilver is killing me right now. Something always goes wrong, huh? Do you think you might get it to work <laughs> while I talk? Oh, yeah, sure. sure. Awesome. Go ahead. All right. So, <laughs> so what is a context for grammar? So shortly, hopefully, we'll have a slide to assist this explanation. But basically, a grammar is a program. They are synonymous, grammar and program. And in the traditional view of grammars uh, that, came, that Chomsky came up with, a grammar is a program that generates every possible string in a language. So 
sentence, a sentence, for instance, uh, Chomsky's analysis. Is, a sentence is, on a basic level, a noun phrase and a verb phrase. A noun phrase is a determ or an article and a noun. And a verb phrase is a verb and another noun phrase. And so noun phrase can be used throughout the language at any spot it needs to be used. Are we up yet? Oh, OK. Um, wow. <laughs> at any spot where it needs to be used. And we spit out this language, every possible combination of it. Man, I really need these slides. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not blaming you, though. <laughs> I just need to wait. Is restart? Yeah, that's OK. Wow. The most reliable machines. Beforehand? My apologies. <laughs> What's my mascot? I had a cool logo on the first slide. So context-free grammars, they generate. But the problem with a context-free grammar is that when it generates, it gives you no indication as to with, when there's redundant structures that, hey, it's working. Yes! It's going to make it so much easier. There we go. Wait, no, the displays aren't mirrored, are they? Arrangement, mirror displays. OK. <laughs> Sorry, guys. OK. <laughs> wow, worthy of applause. OK, so there's the opening slide. Here's the context-free generative grammar. So that thing I was describing in the air is probably a little more tangible now. You can see that a sentence is capable of generating a noun phrase after a verb phrase, and then all of those things have their own definitions. And at the end of it, you can generate things like the dog bites a cat. There's the path of generation, starting with sentence and moving out through the different rules. Here's the sentence, the cat sleeps. The same grammar, reusing some of the same constructs, generating a different example of the language. But there's a problem with generative grammars. There's a problem with viewing grammar as a program that generates every instance of a language. And that problem can be exemplified in this issue, the dangling else problem. So here you see a pretty straightforward rule for an if statement as it appears in most programming language. If some expression, the true statement, followed by the else, the false statement, and then there's this, the case where the, uh, the false statement is optional. So either of those will work. What's the problem? There's ambiguity. So check out this statement here, the string. And you can see that there are two possible representations that may have generated this. We may have first done an if, and then the nested statement would be another if statement. So you see in red that the nested statement has the else attached to it. Or we do the smaller of the two styles of if statements as the nested statement, and the else gets attached to the outer statement. And if we view the grammar as generating, which one, which, which one of these was generated by it? Either is equally likely. So in tools like Lex and Yak, this would be solved by adding another rule on top, which says, oh, by the way, prefer this one. But there's a better solution to this problem, and that is parsing expression grammars. What that is, is instead of viewing grammars as a program that generate language, we instead view grammars as a program that recognizes language. And that works a hell of a lot better when you're writing a parser, because the theoretical tool is in line with the practical tool. So what does that look like? What would the if statement look like in a parsing expression grammar style rule? And it's this. Notice the arrow is flipped around. We're no longer generating. We're recognizing. And the pipe, which designated the or condition, is now a slash. And what this means is there's a prioritized choice 
between these two expressions. So if we match that first one, we don't try the second one. So the grammar is no longer uh, agnostic in regards to which expression is preferred. It tells us this one is preferred because it's greedy. So when we go into this nested statement here, this next if statement is tried and it gobbles the else and that's the end of the story. So the first statement will use the second rule, which is the smaller if without the else dangling on it. So, and by the way, parsing expression grammars obviously are what Treetop uses. So let's take, an, so parsing expression grammars have a very similar syntax to the regular expressions that you're already used to. In fact, they're actually a generalization of vanilla regular expressions. Not like the Perl compatible extended crazy version of regexes, but the original state machine based regexes, parsing expressions are a generalization of them. So here at the top is a regex that everyone that knows regexes could read. And below is the parsing expression grammar equivalent of that regular expression. Now it's a little neater, cleaner, it's a hell of a lot longer. It doesn't really indicate any of the power of parsing expression grammars, but at least you get the idea. The syntax is more or less compatible. Um, so what is it that parsing expression grammars can do that regular expressions can't? And the answer lies in these unquoted symbols here, animal and barks. We're referring to expressions from within another expression, and that therein lies the power of a parsing expression grammar because it enables us to do recursion. So what about this language? This is a language that's impossible to match with a regular expression, theoretically impossible based on something called the pumping lemma. And it's a target language where you have n open parentheses, a letter, and n closed parentheses. Can't do it with a regex. Parsing expression grammars make it pretty simple. Here's the rule that will match that. So a nested parens is an open parentheses followed by another nested parens, followed by a closed parentheses, or just a single letter. Note the use of character classes here, just like regular expressions. Um, <laughs> and the parsing routine matches like this. Nested parens uses another nested parens, uses another nested parens, and finally it bottoms out in the letter right here, and we've reached the end of the expression. So I mentioned that treetop uses parsing expression grammars as its grammar framework. What does a treetop grammar look like? Pretty similar to what you've already seen. Here's parenlanguage.treetop. So treetop files have a custom syntax. They're not Ruby. It's not an embedded DSL. It is a DSL. Um, and it basically, I aim for it to be conservative. So I, my eventual goal is to have grammar and rule as keywords that blend well in with the rest of the Ruby ecosystem. So I'd love to make any Ruby valid inside this file. I don't have a Ruby grammar yet, so I can't do it. So for now, it's limited to grammar and, and rule as your keywords, and you need to write grammars in these files. But it'll open up later on. So notice that it's just like the other rule, but I've wrapped the grammar and named it around the outside. That's what you put in these treetop files. How do we use it in Ruby? We use the load grammar declaration, which is basically like load, except for it knows about grammars. Um, and it'll eventually know about all of Ruby too, but not yet, as I said. We load the paren language grammar. We instantiate a parser, and we go ahead and parse the string. What comes out, and what's put in tree? Is it like the index of where we matched or whatever? No, it's a tree. It is an object-oriented representation of the grammar of the string we have matched. So here you see in green are the inner nodes, the red are the leaf nodes, and on top of each of these circles is a string, is the string that this object represents. So the root string represent, or the root object represents the entire string. And then successively down the green objects represent smaller and smaller substrings of the entire string. And then individual characters are represented by the objects around in the red. So this is a pretty cool data structure. It really represents that language. It would make a hell of a good object-oriented program. If only we could put some methods on these objects, dangle them off, and have them talk to one another, we could write all kinds of interpretation programs for this object graph. Well, treetop lets you do that. So right in the grammar where you define the rule, you can go ahead and define methods. So here's a, me here's a very simple object-oriented program written on top of the program that is the grammar. So there's sort of two programs in this file, uh, which computes the depth of nesting. So it says that if it's a nested parens and it's the first case where there's a recursive reference back to nested parens, then the depth is going to be one plus the depth of that recursive embedded snippet. And otherwise, if we bottom out in a letter, a letter the depth is zero. So that's a simple little recursive uh, dispatch down the 
down the data structure to compute the depth of this structure. Another thing we can do if we don't want to embed the program directly into the, the grammar like I showed earlier, let me show you that one more time by putting a Ruby block right there. Another thing we can do is if we, look, if we go back to this representation, each of these objects is an instance of syntax node, which is part of the treetop runtime. We can have the parser instantiate a custom subclass of syntax node, which is what we're doing here. So we say, when you match this rule, I want you to instantiate a paren node. And paren node is defined below. It's basically the same code. So you can go ahead and farm out logic as you get it written out of the grammar to keep it clean. You could have any mix of the two that you want to do. So now that I've shown you uh, the basics, I'm going to attempt some live coding uh, and build a more complex grammar. Uh, right here in the presentation. So because my computer totally uh, melted down, it's going to take me two seconds. Please don't talk, start talking or milling about just yet. Um, okay. So the expression that we want to match is, and I, also, I had this set up so beautifully. Let me go ahead and do it. Cool. So I'm going to close this over here. Go away. Okay, I'm almost there. All right, so I want to write a grammar that will, I'm going to put this back in presentation mode, skip, 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 skip. Parse the language of arithmetic. So I want to be able to parse an expression like this and compute its value. Now I know what you're saying, that's easy, I just use a vowel. But you know, what if we didn't have a vowel? It's just an example. Um, so let's go ahead and try it. So if you notice at the bottom of this grammar, the simplest, this, by the way, a good way to approach writing a grammar is to draw a tree over an example expression. What does it look like? Just get the lay of the land. You may be wrong, but it's a good place to start. In this case, this is a valid syntax tree that represents arithmetic. We're going to start at the bottom of the tree with the simplest expression. In this case, numbers. Numbers are actually a regular language, meaning they can be parsed by regular expressions. So they'll be really easy to embed in this superset of regular expressions a parsing expression grammar. So let's go ahead and start with a test. Def test numbers. Yep. I code like this actually at work. Um, so what we're going to do in the setup, first of all, is go ahead and do what I showed you from the slide, is, is load the grammar. So we'll say parser equals arithmetic parser dot new. And we'll load a grammar. In this case, it's going to be the arithmetic grammar in the same directory as we're in. OK, so we've got the parser. What should happen when I parse numbers? I'm going to first just try to parse 0. And I'm going to say this should be success. So can, how can I get this to pass? It's not going to pass now, obviously. OK. So let's open up arithmetic.treetop. It's waiting for me and start defining the arithmetic grammar. And we only need one rule in it right now, which is number. And we only need one expression to match, which is zero. And now this should pass. Yep, I do. Thank you. I need to slow down. OK. There. So we match a number, but that's not too impressive. Let's go ahead and try to match something a little tougher. What about one, two, three? So again, I can use ordered choice. And I'm going to go a little ahead of the test because this is a presentation. We don't need to be too pedantic. And say that a number begins with a 1 through 9 and is followed by 0 or more 0 through 9 digits. Just in the domain of regexes here, not too interesting. 
All right, now what if I want to implement a val on number? So basically, I want this to equal 0. What's up? Uh, thank you. Oops. And this to equal 123. So eval isn't implemented yet. Let's go implement it. And I'll parenthesize this entire choice because uh, blocks scope more tightly than, than choices. And I'll say def eval. Now, every syntax node has a method on it called text value. And this is a pretty easy problem. I just 2i the text value of whatever it is. Um, Oh, thank you. You guys are so helpful. All right. So there, that works. The basic eval for numbers. At this point, I'm going to include the grammar test helper because it shortens my life a little bit and just lets me call parse. But that's just using the instance variable. OK. So what's next on the tree? And that would be variables. Also at the bottom of the tree, simpler to parse, but a little bit more tough to eval because you have to eval them in an environment in which they're bound. So let's go test variables. And I'm going to just go for the whole deal. So I'm going to assert equal to the parse of x, eval, and I'm going to represent environments with hash tables. Where, OK. Here, let me How's that? So x in this case is bound to 2. And when I eval x in the environment where x is bound to 2, it should be 2. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and define this here, variable. The variable, I'm just going to say, is a through z, lowercase, one or more of those. I'm going to define a val right here. This time, I'm going to take an environment. And it's just going to be the environment with the name of the variable. And the name of the variable you guessed it, is its text value. Can I shrink one? Uh, I don't need to. OK, so let's see how that worked. So for just this test, it worked quite fine. But can I run them both? No. And the reason for that is that the grammar always has to be rooted at one rule. Something is the tree. And in this case, and it, the first rule is always the root of the grammar. So we try to parse variable first. Variable makes no reference to number. So we've got to find a concept that incorporates both variables and numbers, some syntactic construct that is both of those things. And the answer to that is that we can group both numbers and variables, the set of all of numbers, set of all variables, under the set of all what I will call primary expressions. And those are things that are added together in these arithmetic expressions, the things that clump nice and tightly and can be added and subtracted and so forth. So how do I make that set, that superset of both of these things, get this out of my face, Oops, this two. Um, in my grammar, it's pretty simple. Primary is just a variable or whoops, a number. And now both of my tests should pass. Fantastic. All right, let's work our way up the tree some more. What's next? Multiplication. So that, at first glance, looks pretty simple. It looks kind of like a primary, maybe some space, an asterisk, and another primary. That could actually parse x times 10. So let's start with that and see where we go. Def test multiplicative. This is going to be, I'll make it equal to 20. Parse x times 10. And we're going to eval it in the environment where x is bound to 2 again. So this isn't going to work right now. Let's get it to work. So rule multiplicative. And start with our first guess, primary, some space. I'm going to define that in a second. An asterisk, another space, and another primary. And a space is zero or more white spaces. Note that, yeah, zero or more, that's fine. Note that we have to talk about space in parsing expression grammars because we don't lex. And we'll get into that later if we have time. Um, but trust me, it's worth it. Uh, so let's go back over here and oh, let's define a val, because I didn't do the intermediary step. Def eval. So now you noted that in the other grammar, maybe you remember, I referred to the depth of the nested expression. I actually just referred to it by name. But here we have two expressions called primary. So there's a facility to give things labels. I'm going to call this operand 1 and operand 2. And now 
the eval to eval this, all we have to do is take operand one and eval it in the environment and multiply it by operand two eval in the environment. So we're just writing on top of Ruby's multiply. And let's see how this goes. Thank you. I forgot about that. So I'm going to give number for convenience and giving it a consistent interface, an optional environment, even though it doesn't need one. And there it works. So this works great for that one little case, but what about, oh, and also, okay, so what about the fact that I have to run all the tests now? And again, the same problem comes up where there's a grammar rooted at a multiplicative expression and none of the other ones are admitted. So check it out. What we want to do is make all these tests pass. I'll show you this. They don't. So how can we make that happen? And that's what this slide's all about, is that the set of all primary expressions is a subset of the set of all multiplicative expressions. So you could just as easily put a number or a variable or an entire multiplication there, and it all works. So how do we make that happen? Not too hard, just like what we did before. We're going to go up to multiplicative and add a second option here, which is primary. And run our tests, and we're all green. Okay. So now, what I was kind of jumping ahead on, and I'll get to now, is what about these types of expressions? 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. We only do primary times primary. This isn't going to work. We need repetition. How can I represent this syntactically to make my life easy? That'll work. So that is, it's a, it's a right associative structure. And 4 is considered to be multiplied by the entire 3 times 2 times 1 multiplication. And 3 is considered to be multiplied by 2 times 1 and so on and so forth. How can we implement that? Pretty simple change to our grammar. We take primary in the second case and replace it by multiplicative. Now it'll recurse back around and give us this structure. See how it works for a harder test? Uh, let's do 4 times 3 times 2. And that should be equivalent to parsing 4 times 3 times 2 2 times 1, and we don't need an environment, but I think I require it, so, and it works. Okay, let's move on up the parse tree. Uh, wrong way. Next, addition. Addition has a lot in common with the mul multiplicative expressions, and that is it's got this operator and two operands on either side. It'll have a right recursive structure. The only difference is, is that the things that are being added and subtracted together are multiplicative expressions. That's because of order of operations that multiplies and divides binds more tightly. And we integrate order of operations directly into our grammar in this way. So note the smaller black subtree of x times 10. So because they have so much in common, why don't we just first write a test and then, and I'll write a test for that entire expression, 5 plus x times 10 minus y. 5 plus 2 times 10 minus 5 should be equal to parse 5 plus x times 2 minus y. What's up? Uh, thank you. Eval in the environment in which x is bound to 2 and y and I'm doing it wrong. Thank you. And y is bound to 5. All right, so this is going to fail. Let's add an additive rule into the system. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to grab multiplicative, copy it. First thing I'm going to need to do is replace all of the recursive references, self-references, self uh, and, re and rename it. So this is additive, and this is additive. Next thing I need to do is change the operator. So notice that I support, in this case, plus and minus. So I'm going to call this the additive op and define it down here. And it can be a plus or a minus. We'll get back to those in a second. And we want to replace primary, in this case, with multiplicative. How are we doing on font size? getting harder, but still okay? Okay. Multiplicative. All right. 
So this says additive is a series of additions that add together multiplicatives. And if those happen to be numbers, that's OK, because numbers are multiplicatives. Um, so we'll fall right through to them. And now eval is going to have to be a little bit different, because I can't do plus or minus here. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the additive op. I'm going to apply it to operand 1 eval in the environment and operand 2 eval in the environment. Now I define apply down here. A, B, and this is pretty trivial, A plus B. And define apply down here. And this is A minus B. Okie doke. Let's see how we do. Have I forgotten anything obvious? No. All right. So we have addition, we have multiplication, we have order of operations. What's next? Well, we're kind of chained to the order of operations that we've got. Oh, by the way, this is showing that multiplicative expressions are also a subset of additive, which I think I didn't. Oh, I made it work because I copied the other rule. So note all the tests run. So even when we just have a bare multiplication, things work. Now, what about this? What about using parentheses that override the operator precedence? That's really simple. Uh, note that parentheses are a sort of reset. They say start from the top of the precedence chain and go from there. So basically what that means is they can play the role of a primary expression in any other expression. So I'm going to go to primary. Well, first I'm going to write a test. Def test parentheses. And I'm going to assert the equality of this, but I'm going to copy this, basically, and chuck, chuck in some parentheses here, comparing it against Ruby's behavior for the same thing. OK, move it up, and probably we know it was over there, right? So that x and y, 5 and 2, OK? So this is going to fail right now, because we don't know what parentheses are in our grammar. But they're easy to add. We just go down to primary expression. And now a primary is either a variable, a number, or an open paren, potentially a space, a, an additive expression, or an, uh, an additive, another space, and a closed paren. And basically what that looks like is this. Parenthesized additives are a subset of all of these different expressions, but they have a recursive reference back to the top of the grammar. And that's indicated by this little arrow there. So it kind of loops you back up to the top of the grammar. Um, and now let's write a val. And note that a val, taking an environment, parentheses don't have a semantic contribution. They're purely syntactic in behavior. They control the way our grammar recognizes the language. So all we have to do is just pass the eval method through to additive. We're going to eval that in the environment. And let's see how we do. We do great. So that takes care of my, my live demo. Um, so what is one of the most important things? Oh, thanks. So one important thing, if you've used lex or yak or whatever that you could have noted in this process, is I did not lex. I did not lexically scan, which is basically, for those of you who don't know, it's taking a set of regexes and ripping the buffer open and grouping all these characters into individual tokens that I could recognize. And that's an optimization step that was definitely necessary when lex and yak were written and is still necessary now if you're a hardcore language engineer. But if you're just doing basic things, you can get away with not lexing. And that's based on this thing called pack rat parsing. I can go into that maybe in the question session if people have more interest. But basically, it uses memoization to turn backtracking algorithms that made lexing necessary from exponential time into linear time algorithms. So it becomes algorithmically feasible to not lex. That is the, that is the power that makes this so easy to use. And the great thing is, is that when you don't lexically scan, and that you define your grammar in terms of individual characters down to the character level, your grammars become perfectly compositional. And that is where the coolness of Ruby comes in. Because when I compile these grammar keywords and all the rules inside of them, what I do is I take the grammar and I turn it into a Ruby module. And I replace all the rules with methods. And methods all have their custom in, uh, implementations that munch through the buffer and parse what is necessary. But the point is, is that grammars are modules. And the great thing about modules in Ruby is that they're the mechanism of composition. So you notice that with arithmetic grammar, I had arithmetic parser. 
It wasn't arithmetic.new, it was arithmetic parser. That's because arithmetic's a module that's mixed in the arithmetic parser. So what I can do with grammars then basically is open up a grammar and include other grammars right in my grammar. So imagine this. Well, I'll show you actually. And I'm at, at this point actually, I think I'm going to hand out, I'm not going to have enough for everybody. So just uh, take one if you want one. But I wanted to show you, and I had it all set up, but it's not there anymore. So it'll take me a second. Um, examples. So here, and I'm going to pass out the source code to it, but it's going to be interesting is at the top is, it's not really the lambda calculus. It started as one, but now it's an extended form of the lambda calculus. And this is an interpreter for a simple Turing complete programming language. And it's 132 lines. And without the 2S print convenience stuff, it could be made shorter with a custom syntax. So here is the test for it. And here's an example of factorial implemented in this simple, rather poorly planned language I, I cooked together uh, for the presentation. Um, font. So there's the custom syntax where a backslash represents a lambda. Um, and you can there's define, and there's basic conditionals and all of that. But the interesting thing about this is that at the top, I include arithmetic. And it's a slightly more souped up arithmetic grammar than I baked for you guys here today. But it's a module. I can include it and talk about arithmetic rules now in this grammar. So I take the arithmetic expression in this arithmetic grammar, the top rule is called expression, and I overwrite it. So I say an expression is a definition, a conditional expression, an application, that's a function application, a function or super what expression was in the other grammar. And a lot of people don't know that you can actually super to modules that you've included. So as long as it's in your ancestor chain, you can super to it. Um, that was like a really convenient feature for, for this application. And so basically, grammars are fully composable now. I have source code of the Lambda Calculus Interpreter. I have about 40 copies. So if you don't really want it, if you're going to throw it away, pass it on. And I just will start it here. Um, it includes the. I wouldn't, it's, I'm sure it's not perfect. It works, though. Um, and it's all embedded directly into the grammar, just for clarity. And the interesting thing to note about it is there's only one class in the entire system that isn't specified by defining methods directly on syntax, and that is closure. And that makes sense, because the semantics of the programming language, a lambda calculus-based language, are completely nailed to the syntax in every case, except for the case of where you're doing off closures, because they capture their environment. So you'll see it's just a simple environment passing interpreter like you'd find in SICP, but it's not Lisp. It's custom syntax. And that's the important thing to note here. That's what makes it more interesting than, than the, the Lisp-based Lambda Calculus interpreter example that you did in college or whatever. Um, OK. So moving on, I want to just take a look at other possibilities for this modularity. Um, wow, that, OK. One sec. And that is, imagine doing this. So imagine we had a Ruby grammar, which we don't have right now for Treetop. I want to build it. If someone would build it for me, that'd be awesome. But otherwise, I'll build it eventually. And imagine we had a SQL grammar. And so we wanted to find a Ruby grammar that understands SQL strings when they're embedded inside of Ruby. That would be a nightmare in a Lex and Yak based approach, because the SQL operators would have to be Lex separately, and they would all get con conflicted or whatever. But when we don't Lex, no problem. Include Ruby, include SQL. We override expression, or we, we create an expression rule to be the root of our grammar, and that's just a Ruby expression. And then we, we override Ruby string, and we say Ruby string is a quote a SQL expression and another quote, or just the whatever it was before. Yeah? How do you go about the example one of like the new thing? That? Write, you wouldn't write Ruby grammar with Ruby expression. You're right. And I have not solved it yet. Um, so thoughts are, I'm, I'm interested in people's thoughts. And have some thoughts of my own regarding giving include special syntax in this case where you prefix stuff or whatever. Um, so anyway, that's basically the end of my talk. But you can kind of imagine uh, the possibilities of everyone working on grammars on their own. And as long as they did a good job designing them, we could all use each other's work. 
at long last. And this is something that's never been possible before parsing expression grammars and pack writing. So now I'll take questions. Yes, I didn't cover them, but they are included. So parsing expression grammars include two really awesome operators, bang and ampersand. Bang will, when it proceeds in a parsing expression, will look forward in the buffer, and if that parsing expression matches, immediately fails. So you can say, this, this, and this, not followed by something that matches this. So it's, a, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's like a look around in regexes. And that enables a slight amount of context sensitivity. It's a really powerful tool. And that's what you could do, like, imagine doing something, and this is a very common trick, so I might as well show it to you now. Um, if you want to match a string, the parsing expression for that is a quote. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, is a quote followed by things that are not a quote, but anything else, zero or more of those, followed by a quote. So that's how you can kind of, and that could be an arbitrarily complex expression. Um, so that's a really powerful tool. And then ampersand will look ahead and try to match, but it won't consume. So those are tools you're definitely going to have to familiar, familiarize yourself with. The treetop docs suck right now. I want to get some more up. Um, but you can look at Wikipedia and other, like there's a framework called RATS. Their documentation sucks too. But <laughs> you can piece it together from the examples and stuff for now. Yeah. How strong is the grammar? How strong is the grammar? Yeah, how strong uh, could it be if like LR or? It's stronger than LR in all those. Because LR is all based on look ahead, right? We want to look ahead one token so we never go down the wrong path. And they taught us in compilers class that you couldn't go down the wrong path or else your algorithm would become exponential. Except if you memoize every rule. If every rule remembers that position 35 I tried to parse and I succeeded, but then they threw my results away, but I'm going to store them in a hash table. Suddenly you have linear space and linear time complexity. Uh, actually, I'm just curious about what happens when you start compositing based on rule bases. You have to be uh, think about looking at and start doing conflicting rules. You want things like memorization. How do you basically make sure that one grammar which works and lets it flexes correctly individually doesn't end up getting more or less trapped or otherwise overwritten or stopped on by the one so really you can use the same kind of reasoning for doing includes that you use with Ruby programming includes when you're mixing modules in and stuff. And that is, you're stomping names, you're stomping names, and I need to build a facility that enables you to prefix names. But basically, once you've included everything, that grammar is the same type of grammar as if you wrote it all in line right there. So because every expression is self-contained, Meaning you can look ahead in that expression, but its meaning is completely constrained. It's not affected by anything in the outside world, unless it wants to be. There are no such conflicts. Like, things don't step on each other, really. The only thing name conflicts could occur. Uh, and you'll have to design grammars carefully, I think, just like you have to design programs carefully to make them modular. Uh, but I think, unless I'm missing something huge, that that's not actually an issue. And I don't know if I addressed it that well, but... So you can you can't I don't know if you can do ampersand 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 I don't I don't really remember I don't think you can um, but it's meaningless anyway one ampersand is enough but you can do something interesting like this uh, not oh god <laughs> not, not. so this is like if you had a keyword then you'd want it to be not followed by a non-space character. So that would mean like, say you had a keyword death. Death is a keyword, but death metal is not a keyword, <laughs> right? <laughs> so this will match, right? Because he, death is not followed by a non-space character. It's follow, and even death at the end of the buffer, right? That's not a non-space character, it's the end of the file. So you can do kind of weird compositional semantics with these look-ahead operators. It took me a while to come up with that one. That might even be wrong, but I think it's right. Um, and I used it in treetop for the end keyword, because end would always occur at the end of the buffer. And so I, at first I had like def, follow, like a, the keyword followed by a space. That's what I want. 
not true. I just want the keyword not followed by a non-space character. And the end of the line, it's not followed by anything. Great question. So that was a source of much agony because there's all this backtracking. You fail all the time when it's okay to fail. When you're looking ahead, the first failure you hit is the end of the game. But when you're backtracking like this, you can fail, 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 and eventually find the right answer. So the solution which I pulled from, by the way, Brian Ford is, did all the seminal work on this stuff, um, or most of the modern seminal work on this stuff. Um, his solution was, I record the furthest ahead in the buffer failures that occur. So the assumption is, is that if I get far and in forward into the buffer, um, how much time do I have? I, have, I guess I have a little. Um, so imagine in C we say, and this is probably not even true, in Java or something, we have expression, and there's a semicolon, and there's, so we expect to see an open brace, and then multiple of these, okay? So let's say my grammar, is this, right? And I go parsing this. And I parse, 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 and then I hit a regular, or I hit an expression that's missing its semicolon. And I fail right there. But it's one or more, so I've seen one. So that actually, that expression matched just fine. I've seen one expression, so that rule returns the list of expressions that I found. But my, like, if I'm, <laughs> let me show you the concrete example. Um, something like this. Uh, print one semicolon, print two semicolon, print three, no semicolon, and the semicolon is required on the last statement, unlike C or whatever. Um, so you see that the parser will go, okay, I see a semicolon. Okay, print one, that's a valid statement. Okay, I only need to find one or more of those, so I'm good from here out. All right, print two, that's a valid statement. Great, I've got two. Print three, that's invalid, so I rewind to here. Oh, well, I found one or more statements. I'm going to return them, and now I'm going to look for a close brace, and I expected a close brace, but I saw P. That's not a very useful parse error for a user. But what I can do instead is I can record the last furthest forward parse error that I encountered during the parse, and that was the missing semicolon when I tried to parse this rule. So the assumption, and it's a simplifying assumption, but I haven't been able to come up with a scenario where it is wrong, is that the error that occurred farthest forward, or any the set of errors that occurred farthest forward are the most interesting error. Yes. How do you recover from that? Say you can't. So, yeah, you're, if, if something doesn't match syntactically, you get a parse error back, and then you can ask it for its nested failures to figure out why. But just like you can't eval a Ruby file if there's a syntax error. But with languages like HTML or CSS, where they do have fail states or, or the ability to recover themselves. It's true. This can't do it. The only way I can imagine you being able to do it is to include every possible weird case that you want to admit in part of your formal grammar definition. But beyond that, if you want special, you know, special uh, robustness or something like that, then you won't be able to use tree top unfortunately. Could you just rescue at some point and restart the grammar going forward? Presumably, I don't know. Um, and I'm interested in any ideas about making things more robust because it would be really valuable. So please email me if you have ideas regarding that. I don't see it in the gym, and I don't see it on Ruby. Um, it doesn't really exist. There's a README file. Um, I'm, I'm working on it. What? Where is the crappy documentation? And I guess that was an overstatement about my documentation. Um, <laughs> Crappy is in like next to non-existent. I have a README that's got a basic intro tutorial that doesn't cover any more than I covered here. Um, I do have tests. They're all there were RSpec and then RSpec had some weird comp behavior, so I like ripped test unit open and made this thing called screw unit, which is um, <laughs> like uses strings and defines methods with them and stuff like that. Um, but I'm probably gonna go back to RSpec now that they fixed uh, this particular issue I was having. Um, but yeah, you can read those, and they should be pretty helpful. Uh, there's an interesting, like, if you look at the code that's generated, it's very readable. I spit out comments, it's all indented and stuff like that. So you can really get a feel of how the parse is occurring. Um, and talk to me about how to make it faster, et cetera. I would love it.
Yeah. So separate from the Ruby implementation called TrueSoft, how do PEGs compare performance-wise to other techniques? Are they just cooler, or are they slower to get that coolness, or? They are, I mean, they're going to be more resource intensive because they, A, take more memory. In my case, I'm instantiating objects every time I match which if I did like some C extension that only allocated structs or whatever and did a final pass that only instantiated objects, like objects take forever to instantiate in Ruby. So you definitely pay for it, this level of expressiveness. In terms of like more mature tools like the RATS library in Java, he did a comparison that said he was definitely slower but not, not devastatingly so. So I know that's really vague because um, I honestly don't remember that well. But I remember looking into it when I was doing RATS. Um, for this project I was on, and I, I found it to be more than adequate. So I basically like took the, the guarantees about linear complexity, both in space and time, and I said, those are good enough for me because this is so expressive compared to the more optimized frameworks that I'm willing to just deal with it later. And so I've gotten it reasonable, and we'll see where it goes from here. <laughs>